Good evening, friends. Peacemaking is going on in the world and is the theme for today's call. By coming together with like-minded people to consciously cooperate in new ways, we can build structures of peace and a culture of peace to co-create the world we want to see. Hello, I'm Lauren Oliver. I'm co-director of Circles Work. Welcome to the ribbon cutting for this year-long Social Artistry Peacemaker Circle teleconference that brings together the field of social artistry with the power of circle to equip you with the skills and tools you need to co-create the new story. We have charted a path this year to follow the steps of the great peacemaker following the book, The Manual for the Peacemaker, a thrilling story authored by Jean Houston and Margaret Rubin. Partis the themes will be elaborated by eminent peacemakers who will join us each month, the third Wednesday of each month, to tell us about peacemaking as they do it in their lives and as they encourage us to enlarge our peacemaking actions in the world. Participants are invited to start a circle of peacemakers, a core group with whom you may take this journey and gain support to transform your intentions and your unique gifts into peacemaking action in the world. Social artists will find support in their peacemaking circle as well as an outlet for feedback and reflection, collaboration, and a place to continue your social artistry and peacemaking work in the world as part of your daily life. My mission in co-sponsoring this teleconference with the Jean Houston Foundation is to build healthy community by convening circles. I've worked as a member and as a trainer of circles, learning and exploring different models for 35 years. I believe our society needs to connect with one another in small groups, conscious circles, where we talk about what really matters and where we support one another to become our best selves and act to make a difference, cooperating to create a peaceful world that works for all living beings. When I see isolation and when I see people feeling helpless and hopeless up against a behemoth, I want to bring them together and empowered for the common good. I want to bring them the experience, the teaching, the practice, and the community of Circle and working together cooperatively. We can connect the existing network of social artists and beyond, inviting new people who do not know about their social artistry and are ready to do more in peacemaking. I'd like to introduce my guests today, Dr. Jean Houston and Tricia Webster. I think many of you know Dr. Jean Houston. She's a scholar, a philosopher, and researcher in human capacities. She's one of the foremost visionary thinkers and doers of our time. She is the founder of a mystery school that began in 1983 and creator of the work known as Social Artistry. An inspiring and dynamic speaker, she is in demand worldwide. She has worked in over 100 countries, frequently in collaboration with the United Nations. She is a prolific writer and author of 26 published books, as well as many unpublished manuscripts. Jean is with us tonight to share some thoughts about how to be powerfully in circle and to get us started with the great peacemaker as he began his journey, strangely enough, in a stone canoe. I'd also like to, into, uh, to introduce <laughs> sorry, Trisha Webster, and many of you also know Trisha. She's a professional consultant, speaker, and coach who specializes in helping leaders and organizations 
develop their visions and translate them into action. Trisha has studied and worked with our speaker, Dr. Jean Houston, since 2001. She is a social artistry trainer for the Jean Houston Foundation. Her passion and work revolve around the development of our essence intelligence. Trisha, I'm so delighted you could join us this evening to center our circle. Thank you, Lauren. It is wonderful to be part of the circle tonight. And it's my privilege to guide you through an opening, centering meditation. And to do that tonight, I'm going to read you a poem that speaks to the idea of stepping into the open moment. And surely we're in an open moment right now. So I'll invite you before I read just to get comfortable wherever you are. Close your eyes. Uh, and as you listen, treat the words of the poem as a promise, as if they're being spoken directly to you. So just breathe in these words now and please just receive them. This is Poem for a New Beginning by John O'Donohue. In out-of-the-way places of the heart, where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has been quietly forming. This beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness grow inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, wondered, would you always live like this? Then the delight when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plentitude opening before you. Though your destination is not clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. You can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you. So I'm going to ask you to quietly repeat to yourself inside a few of the key words from that poem. So I'll read them once and ask you to repeat them. And speak them for yourself into our circle. This beginning has been quietly forming. My eyes are young again with energy and dream. A path of plenitude is opening before me. I can trust the promise of this opening. And from this place of opening this evening, of beginning, will you now just reach out in spirit to connect with all of those here in our circle, heart to heart. And into the center of this circle, send now your intention for deep learning and growth for yourself and for everyone participating here tonight. Just send it into the circle, sending it in, doing so now. And knowing that we hold this intention collectively for each other, both as individuals and as a whole circle. So in the words of John O'Donohue, awaken your spirit to adventure, hold nothing back. You can trust the promise of this opening. And so we begin tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. That was indeed a marvelous centering for our circle, an invitation to this new beginning. And I thank you for creating sacred space for us to share together this evening. As you all sense, centering is an important convention we use as part of our circle practice. 
to establish our intention and focus energies to the heart of the circle, just as Trisha invited us to do. Each time, there are many ways we can center our circle and create sacred space, and you're encouraged to do this each time we meet in circle. Ordinarily, we next move into check-in in our small face-to-face -face circles of 8 to 10 people. We want to hear every voice include each member fully and get a sense of where this person is coming from today, who she or he is today. We will not do this this evening on our virtual circle. It would take an enormous amount of time, but please know that you are welcome. Your individual voice is welcome, and you will have a chance later. We will, after Jean speaks, break up into virtual circles where every, each person can introduce him or herself to the other three people you'll be in circle with, and you'll also have a chance to think about the questions that you have for Jean, and then to ask them. Um, Dr. Jean Houston will speak next and will describe the source of the powerful vision of the great peacemaker who did the impossible and responded to this open moment. She'll tell us a bit about how she heard the story and learned that the Iroquois Constitution is woven into the roots of our American democracy. I'd like to let you know, if you're not aware, that Jean did a wonderful, uh, inspiring telling of the entire story in May, on May 16. And if you have not heard a recording of that call, if you were not there in person, you can go to circleswork.net, and the recording is available on the home page. You can listen to the full extent of Jean's thrilling, thr thrilling uh, rendition of this story. Tonight, we will um, hear the, about the beginning of the journey of the great peacemaker. And after we have Q&A with Jean also, we'll talk about the guidelines that are offered in the first section of Manual for the Peacemaker that remind us some of the simple guidelines for having your own circle with like-minded people, which is a simple yet powerful process. There are many approaches to do this, but we'll give you guiding um, thoughts about some of the best things to keep in mind. So, Jean, please, uh, let me hand this off to you with just a brief reminder. If any of our listeners have not yet registered on the Gene Houston Foundation for this program, I encourage you to do that. When you go, it's on the front page of the, um, the home page of the GeneHoustonFoundation.org. And there also you're strongly encouraged to register for the live programs going on in Ashland at the end of July through August 12. Again, at the top of the home page of the GeneHoustonFoundation.org, you'll see the three main sections of the work going on in Ashland, all exciting opportunities, the summit and the Congress, a workshop with Peggy Rubin, and then an opportunity to be trained as a trainer in social artistry. Please take advantage of these wonderful opportunities, and we welcome you to the community of social artistry tonight and in Ashland. Very shortly. Jean, and now... Yes, thank you so much. Thank you very, very much. We are about now to launch into the legend about a bringer of peace, a creator of community, a changer of his world. 
And friends, it is one of the richest stories to come out of North America. Yet, you know, it's an irony that very few non-Native Americans know it. It tells of a man whose name cannot be mentioned except in very important ceremonies, so we refer to him as the peacemaker or the man from the north. And his incredibly successful campaign to create a peaceful and prosperous society where, where previously there had only been long, long years of violence and intertribal warfare. Well, friends, so potent is this legend, so full of power and wonder, that it embodies the essence of myth, yet many of its elements are thought to be historically true, that this, is, that this man did live somewhere between the 11th and the 15th century, and that uh, what happened actually occurred. I mean, so potent is it, so full of marvel. I mean, it, 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 he had allies. His allies were Jigana Sasi, remembered as the mother of nations, who really helped him to create the model for a model society. And the great orator, Hayan Watha, remembered as Hiawatha, and not on the shores of Gitche Gumi, but the real Hiawatha. <laughs> and together they created a peaceful democracy among five tribes of the native peoples in the uh, northeastern woodlands. True democracy that lasted for hundreds of years and still does. And the European settlers gave this nation the name Iroquois, but they called themselves, in as many pronunciations, the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. Now, this is an archetypal power. This is a man who does not arrive from on high with messianic ambitions and, and answers spelled out and a completed plan. Even though he feels himself invested by spirit, the important thing, friends, is when it comes to peacemaking, you do what he did, you invite others to help clarify the message, carry it forward, and, uh, and, and create a peace that is feisty and rich, not some dull and sipid dove. Don't let the war boys hog it all, the spit, the spice, and the glamour. Peace is passionate. And so this new peace is expressed through dynamic cooperation and conversation and, and an intensive sharing of ideas and ceremony. It's peace that appeals to all levels of human experience, physical, psychological, mythic, spiritual. And so powerful was the story, and so powerful is what happened with the Iroquois. Ben Franklin used to attend their council meetings, and he came and he said, as did the, the, those of the others who were starting the whole American dream, this is the model that we should build upon. And indeed, it played the, the peacemaking and the peace, the prosperous society of the Iroquois became the basis, not just for American democracy, but for democracies all over the world. I, I I first heard it from uh, a very great Native American named Mad Bear Anderson, who belonged to the Iroquois, and uh, who really helped me when I was, oh my, I was in charge of one of the huge events around the 30th anniversary of the United Nations, and we had people, all the religious leaders from all over the world, and anything that could go wrong did, you know, as you would expect with religious leaders <laughs> anyway, but it was the Native people who really pulled it together. Who, who really contributed and uh, g created a peaceful, creative conference out of what could have been just incredible hostilities between the world's religious leaders. Anyway, so Mad Bear told me this great story of the peacemaker. And as he told it to me, oh, friends, I, I felt as if, as if I were being initiated into some great community of hearers who, who transcended time and place and tribe or nation. There was such sacred power in the story. Its words were doors that opened up to a possible world and gave one the actual skills and training and means to inhabit that world. And that telling became part of my bones. And I've continued over the years to seek it in so many different variations. You know... And so it is not just history, it's also myth, and it has enormous, enormous authority because it is a soul-charging tale and one that is rich in the details of how you actually go about creating an optimal society, a society that is peaceful, prosperous, as well as democratic, a society that, well, that addresses the spiritual and the psychological as well as the economic and political needs of humankind, a society that speaks to partnership between men and women, 
and to cooperation between nations, a society that fosters and promotes peace as a living entity. It is a phenomenal story, and if you want to get to the full thing, as, as uh, Lauren said, there is a version of it that you can uh, click on, but also you can look at my book called uh, that I did with Peggy Rubin, Manual for the Peacemaker. Now, the great story begins, as all mythical tales begin in mystery, that a virgin was conceived somewhere around Lake Ontario among the Hurons, and she told her mother, "Mother, I've never, I've never been with any man." And it was a tremendous uh, scandal. So, after uh, the baby was born, the, 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 they, they, they really tried in one of the myths to, you know, get rid of the child, but the child couldn't get rid of. They tried to throw it in the ice, and the and the child was found, you know, sleeping next to them because. And then they got this this message that this is a not only a holy child. This is someone who is going to bring a new order, a new peace, a new world, a new possibility. So as the peacemaker started to grow up in this family, uh, he, he, he had a, a, a real uh, a little problem. <laughs> he had a handicap. He, he spoke with great difficulty. He stuttered. And so he was sometimes called the one with a double row of teeth. And, you know, which often happens that those who come and bring the great possibility almost invariably <clears throat> come in with a handicap. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi was horribly shy, painfully shy. Uh, I mean, there's, there are all these stories attached to the handicap. Well, anyway... He was remarkable. He was honest and good and enormously intelligent and generous. And the animals loved him. And because he couldn't talk very well, he would go and talk to the animals. He communicated. He whistled to the birds. And they came to sit on his shoulders like with St. Francis. He, he conversed with the fireflies in the night. And the morning saw him in communion with a bear. And rabbits came out of their burrows to be with him. And snakes swayed in front of him, imparting their earthy wisdom, you know. And just like with Francis, you know. And they, the, the warlike Hurons, of whom he was a member of the tribe, they thought, this is one very strange character. And when he began to talk about his revelations in the forest about peace, they said, this is a really stupid guy. I mean, war is where, where a young people and the tribe find their identity. It's what makes life worth living. And they were in tremendous warfare, you know, with the neighboring tribes. Well, he kept, he went deeper and deeper into his deep meditations in the forest and with nature and with the animals, and he came, began to come out with a, an extraordinary vision of a new society based on peace and friendship. So, but it was very clear that nobody was buying it. It was like with Jesus of Nazareth, who once remarked ruefully, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. <laughs> well, the peacemaker was no exception. So the taunting continued, and he knew, he said, Great Spirit, show me what it is that you wish me to do among the nations. Show me the plan of my mission. And he started to get the plan. And he said to his mother and grandmother, The time has come for me to set out on my mission. I shall now build my canoe. I go seeking the council smoke of nations, and that is just what he did. So the day that he, 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 he made himself a stone canoe, a stone canoe out of, I guess, white stone. And his, his parents, his my grandmother, said, you, you, this is going to sink. This is going to sink. You cannot set out on a journey in a stone canoe. I mean, what you plan to do in talking about peace is impossible. First of all, you stutter so much, who's going to understand you? And, and you're, you're, you're crazy. You're just as crazy as everybody says. This is going to sink. And the peacemaker said, no, no, it's going to float, Grandma. You'll see. And by this impossible action, you shall know that my words are true and that I shall bring peace to the nations. And with that, he pushed the canoe into the water and he paddled away. Now, why a stone canoe? Certainly stone is the most compacted form of earth, yet its form of star stuff, isn't it? it? has a sense of eternity about it. 
and by grounding himself thoroughly in a stone canoe, the peacemaker connected to the earth and its indestructibility. And setting out in a stone canoe, knowing that he could not only keep it from sinking, but also travel to new lands, he knew himself capable of performing the impossible. Now this is so important. Because what this story represents in its very beginning is that our willingness to undertake an impossible task and the and our awareness of power and authority of the truth just as the one that, that the peacemaker carried. So what we think of as seemingly impossible things that people have done, we find that pushing the boundaries of the possible is a very natural form for the human race. In fact, it comes with the human condition. It's what makes life worth living. Attempting the impossible hones our pluck and cunning and calls up resources that we never knew we had. And I'm reminded of the great poet Rilke's words when he said, we must assume our existence as broadly as we in any way can. Everything, even the unheard of, must be possible in it. This is at bottom the only courage that is demanded of us. We have to have courage for the most strange, the most inexplicable. And surely, my friends, we are in the time of having to do the impossible, are we not? With all the challenges, with all the complexities, with the ecological, the economic, with the, oh, with the sense of the enormous conflict that is there. But you know, look what's happened in your lifetime especially some of the longer lives like mine, the discovery and exploration of, of the full earth, both in its microcosm and its macrocosm, the finding of cures to fatal diseases, the creation of the United Nations, the linking of the earth's people through the electronics, the conquest of hundreds of years of prejudice. The, uh, the, you know, it is, we are startled at the vision of what people are doing all over the world. And I know you just get the horrible news of the bad things, I can assure you. And I'm in a position to say this. For every bad thing that you hear about, there's a thousand good things going on. Oh, yes. So I want you to think, as part of your first exercise, I want you to think that in this extraordinary moment, this extraordinary moment of the planet's history in which we must bring peace, as I said, peace that is so rich and full of flavor that, frankly, it makes sense to make peace. So this is what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to invoke the spirit of the peacemaker. Invoke the spirit of the peacemaker. Allow the peacemaker to enter fully into the lake of your heart, granting you something of what he said was possible. New mind, new heart, new understanding of the message, the challenge, the task of peacemaking. And I want you to, and this is something that you can do in your talks with each other in a few minutes. I, I'd like you, if you can, at least with one hand, the other hand is probably holding the phone, to take a paddle and have a sense of paddling and feel the canoe pushing out into the lake. And as you paddle, think or speak of something that you have done in your life that seemed impossible at the time, but you did it. So do that. So I'm doing it now, and I'm thinking, I see myself there on the shore as a child who hated to write. And there I am as an adolescent, and there I'm in college, and even though I'm in graduate school, I still hate to write. In fact, with few exceptions, I still dislike writing. There's nothing I like less to do, nothing for which I feel I have less talent. But people ask me, do you channel your books? I tell them I fight for every darn word. And yet I've produced 26 published books, and I continue to write. Why? Because I decided to embrace the impossible and by God just get on with it and do it. Because my message demanded expression in written words and my inner truth urged me to keep paddling, keep writing until I moved beyond the blocks in my mind. And so I've got to keep on developing. I keep have to keep on writing and doing and expressing. So 
So think about some impossible thing that you did and keep on paddling. And then I have a second part for you. And I'd like you at first to talk back and forth when you get into the group. But now I want you to keep on paddling and speak about what something that you feel you must do in the near future that calls you and somehow you're going to do it, but you really think, you know what, it's really impossible. Remember, that's only a small part of you that thinks that the thing is impossible. There are other parts of you that are utterly innocent of the odds and don't know that it's impossible at all. You know, the old part of the brain, the old survival reptilian brain that protects you, may keep going, hey, hey, no, wait, don't do that. It's something, it's not safe, forget it. But it's so wonderful being human because we've got this frontal cerebral cortex, innocent, inventive, a little bit naughty, full of mischief, saying, what's next? Hey, come on, let's see what happens. So parts of you in your brain-mind system will think that things are impossible, but other parts will give you both the impetus to keep crossing the thresholds and the power to begin to co-create with time and history in this impossible, wonderful time in which we live. So you will think of that. Because remember what happened in the story of the peacemaker. What happened is that he went out and he met people in conflict, but he sat down with them and in his stuttering way, he, he inspired them to begin to create a new peace, to think about what a new society would truly look like, especially when he met the great peace woman, Jagana Sasi, and together they created the model of an optimal society. And they went out and then with, with the orator of the man who had once been a cannibal because he'd been so brutally hurt, and then he, he was transformed by by the peacemaker's possibilities and he became a peacemaker and they went all over through the all the tribes through the five great nations and they invoked a whole new order they talked they created team wakes networks of of people who said what is spiritual power how can we live it what what is a balanced and just society what is good health and education and they created this extraordinary society that lives into this day so that is the story. That is the story. And what we're going to do in the next few minutes is to meet in small groups, just for a few minutes, and we're going to engage the question, what have I done that is impossible? What have I yet to do? And most importantly, given this what is the impossible thing that we must do for the earth, for the people, for the all sentient beings in this most colossally critical time in human history? And how can we make it happen? So, Ms. Lauren, if you would take it away and create the groups. And then I'll come back and also, you know, and generate between yourself questions that you would like to ask me, and then we will have a wonderful time just in an even larger peacemaker circle, and we'll talk about some of these questions that you would have. So let's begin. Thank you so much, Jean. This is wonderful. I would love to give instructions to the group, um, the whole group, about the breakout circles, the virtual circles. Would you please, Jean, repeat one more time the, your instructions about the three questions that they are to consider? Yes. What have I discuss? done that has that is impossible? What have I yet to do that is impossible? What is the impossible thing that we must do on our planet during our lifetime to make a world that is peaceful, creative, and works for almost everyone? Marvelous, Jean. So it's each of us to look at our past, what have we done, our near future, what yet must we do, uh, what individually, and then collectively, what must we do. Wonderful. So in a few moments, we will put you in a small room with a virtual circle of three other people. And I invite you to do one round to say your name, where you are from, and one to two words to describe how you're feeling right now. Then do a second round, please, and say, what have I done? 
and what have I yet to do to create, the, to do the impossible? And then a third round on what must we do together to do the impossible in this world. And as Jean asked, you know, bring some questions back from your circle also. Um, let's take 10 minutes for this circle. So it's not a lot of time, one round to check in your name, where you're from, and how you're feeling right now. A second round on doing the impossible, what you have done, what you will do. And then a third round, what we will do and the questions for Jean. I will make a bell to begin, and then we'll give you another bell one minute before you are to complete, and then a final bell to bring you back to the main room. All right, let's hear the bell to begin. Welcome back from your virtual circle. I am excited to hear what you have discussed. And I invite you to raise your hands to share something impossible that you have yet to do or something impossible that you know we must do together. We did have a writing question yes. from Ray. So let me yeah. give you Ray's question. It's not exactly on. It, it really gets to uh, what yeah, is the impossible that we must do. Sure. He wrote, what do you think it will take to evolve our political system such that <laughs> Democrats and Republicans can again function as one body working in the best interest of the public they are elected to mm -hmm. serve? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, right now there is so much conflict between the two parties ideologically that it may be something beyond the party system, you know. Uh, we, we, one of the things we have to think way, way out of the box now, and that things that had been successful in the past may not continue in the same way in the future. But yet impossible things happen. I mean, you look at the extraordinary movements of our time, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid in South Africa, the, the, some of the early environmental victories, and you see that things can change on a large scale. So rather than doing that, I'd like to address something that you, you find in uh, uh, one, one of the... Uh, some of you know some of the work that has been done uh, to really look at, you know, the story of stuff. Well, that same lady is now doing the story of change. You can find it on, on the Internet. And one of the things that they say is, you know, what do you need? And there's three things. The first is a big idea, a big, just like the peacemaker had, a very big idea of how things can be better. Something that, as she says, is morally compelling, ecologically sustainable, and a socially just idea that will not just make things a little better for a few, but a lot better for everyone. And there's so much stuff out there to really make this happen. Just look at Yes Magazine. It pours out tremendous stuff on things that will work. And all over, all over the world, all over the world, people are trying to come together to say, you know, how can we have an economy based on the needs of people and the planet, not just for out of the corporate profit, which is what's going on now and is destroying the very, uh, you know, economic structure of America. And that brings us to economics, you know. Ah, you know, how do we create uh, a society in which the soul of culture is no longer a satellite to economics, but economics is a satellite to a soul of culture? So whatever is the big idea, to have a big idea. And then second... And just as with, with the peacemaker, when they went around and they got real buy-in from all the tribes, and, and it took years, a commitment to get people to work together. And that's what happens with peace, a commitment to work together. 
So, you know, when you look, as, as uh, the lady who did the, the story of change, you don't just look at uh, people who say, well, I'm going to perfect myself in my, in my, in my daily choices. I'm just going to work on myself, and that's all. And then maybe at a certain point I'll be able to work with others. No, no, you work on yourself while you're working in society. You see, when, when you look at the nature of transformative social movements, you say we'll work together until the problem is solved, until we can find new ways of being and doing. Because it is much easier to work together rather than to work apart. I mean, the new networks, the fact that the world mind is taking a walk with each other in uh, this new society that is emerging that is probably going to transform even the way we think of governance. I mean, I myself see within the next 50 years, if not much sooner, a world civilization with high appreciation and individuation and deepening of each individual culture. And third, we need all of us who share that big idea to get active and get get going. And I think we need together, and this is one of the things that the peacemaker did. He helped people move beyond their frustration, beyond their sense of, of awfulness and fearfulness, to a place where everybody felt that they were part of this new drama, this new possibility, new citizenry. And that's how you build the power to make real change. So, yes, aim high. Don't think that we're just going to get the two parties to work together. What you're seeing there, I suspect, is, and this is a very radical thing to say, but you're seeing the diminution of the party system and something else is trying to rise. That doesn't mean that you won't have parties 100 years from now, but something else is trying, trying, trying to come in. So we, we really work together from inside out and together to make the kind of change we know is possible. Something else that I'd like to say in relation to this, and this is so important, is that we have an idea <clears throat> of what a peaceful, creative, passionately interesting <clears throat> society can be so that we have a lure of becoming and not just some kind of, oh, it's so nice to make peace. We have to have a dynamic, specific, strategic, brilliant, very high in the particulars of, our, of what a passionate, peaceful society would look like. And right now it has to be a world society, I suspect, that we start where we are. That would be my answer. That's beautiful, Jean. Um, I loved your point that we need to work together, work together while one works on oneself, and the focus is, you know, action. And these peacemaker circles are really about people joining together, working on yourself, mm -hmm. getting your own destiny, your own gifts, your own contributions clear, but then also recognizing and encouraging one another, work together and find that point of action that you can do together. Okay, can, can we, are people writing things in? Because if we can't hear yes. them. Yes, yes. So Jean, um, Robin wrote in, uh, she talks about a new century pledge that she has uh -huh. written that she would like to share. And yeah. it says, I pledge allegiance to Mother Earth and to the life force which she supports. One planet full of diversity with cooperation, integrity, and participation for all. And she thanks you so much, Jean. She loves to hear your voice, and uh, she, she used to be a humble person. She, she wishes us all well. Very good. Um, yeah. Oh, and Robin also has a health care plan. But, uh, oh, I, my scrolling isn't working very well either. How odd. Um, let's see if somehow I see OSHA has had her hand up. And okay. let's see if we can get OSHA and hear her. Mm -hmm. Osha, we have unmuted you and we have put you on the large mic. Mm -hmm. Can we hear you, Osha? Come in, Osha. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really need an engineer when you work with Maestro, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. There's, there's, yes. There's and lots of things. Yeah. You it's really important. Simple. Yeah, well, it, it is. It's it's not as simple as it claims to be. One really needs an engineer to work with you when you do with the Maestro. But if people could just drop, you know, write things into you, do you have an email where people can write things in and then you can read the questions? Yes. Um, well, ordinarily we've been using the feedback from the dashboard here. Um, I do see uh, Robin West's uh, health care plan based on local organic produce and yeah. chart changing, uh, changing the stores and how they function. So this mm-hmm. is the impossible that um, Robin sees we must do. See if OSHA has been able to write in on the okay. dashboard. I, I haven't written in. Ah. Oh, we got a word. OSHA? Good. Hi, I'm here. I didn't know if you could Good. hear me or not. We hear you and now. now. We Wonderful. Can. Okay, I'm not on the dashboard. I, I um, just I was speak speak on the dashboard. We hear okay, you. So, we all can right, hear I'll you. Speak. I'll speak. So I was going to speak to that. Um, question of, you know, doing the impossible. And as I thought about it, I realized that one of the things that is probably the thing I feel the best about that I've done that has seemed impossible is in mediation and sitting in a room with various parties you know, who come in at war with each other and investing a lot of energy making each other into, you know, the enemy. And um, and what I really, really love was discovering that by facilitating your conversation, you could, you, you could watch them turn the corner and begin to use the same amount of energy that they use in making each other the enemy into finding ways to contribute to each other, to contribute to a collaborative solution. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, it's, I, I, and I think, you know, others would probably have given up before I did. <laughs> but somehow, you know, in me there is a very tenacious piece of holding that, holding that space for it to happen. Um, so I think that's the impossible thing that I want to, to, to continue forward with. Um, perhaps on a larger scale. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it takes, you know, it's that persevering when it seems so impossible that people are so entrenched in this idea of warfare and making the other person wrong. And uh, just to know that what they really deeply want underneath that is to satisfy their human need for contributing to each other, for finding a way to help each other and support each other. And I've watched it time and time and time again. Um, so, so I know that that is what is really true about us. That is true. And I'm going to ask Tricia Webster, who has done so much of this work of, of crossing the great divide of otherness between people in so many different kinds of uh, communities. Can you respond to, to her, please, Tricia, mm-hmm. to what she's saying? Tricia can come through while she's on. But anyway, you, you, you are really quite right. And, you know, the, uh, the arts and sciences of mediation are among the most important arts that are in the world today, truly. Um, I'm thinking of that wonderful book, and I'm trying to remember uh, who wrote it, because it's an old friend of mine, actually, called Getting, Getting to Yes. Do you know that? Going Beyond oh, Fisher. No. Fisher. Yes. Yeah. Fisher no, not, 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 not Fisher. Who, who is it? It's uh, Bill. <laughs> What's Bill's last name? I used to know Bill. Anyway, but th- there's so much in in, the, in those books. Um, and then you have the, the nonviolent c- communication books. Mm-hmm. Marshall but, Rosenberg. Uh, it, you know, he, I think it's about... Rosenberg. How, yeah, it, it's... 
it's uh, yeah, Roger. It was Roger Fisher, right? And and Bill Urey, who I used to know. Uh, very very powerful books of of really straightforward, universally applicable methods for negotiating in 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 dis, in uh, disputes without getting caught up. And it starts with and a very really excellent uh, step by step proven strategies for continuing to mutually acceptable agreements in any kind of conflict whether it involves parents and children or neighbors or bosses or employees or customers or, or diplomats, and uh, that comes out of a tremendous project known as the Harvard Negotiation Project. And uh, they, they continuously deal with all levels of negotiating conflict. But there's really been, as you, you're rightly saying, a revolution in understanding how to do this. But if you also really, you folks really work together or create your own groups based on my little book, Manual of the Peacemaker, you're going to find all kinds of very dramatic ways to shift from conflict to coherence to go from chaos to cosmos and above all to cross the great divide of otherness and realize that ultimately we are all inseparable I think that, that's so true that's so true Jean and Osha um, beautiful comments and I um, in in the circles in the peacemaker circles yes. uh, once we do the kind of deep listening compassionate mm-hmm. listening to one another we also encourage people to clear the air um, before you complete your circle when there are some very light misunderstandings questions inquiries um, making sure any unfinished business is addressed in the circle and not swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. This is a great preventative for things that could become conflicts but need not ever become so. It's like in the poem that Tricia uh, read to us, there's that invitation to uncertainty. When we can acknowledge our uncertainty and just check it out with one another, uh, it's amazing what clarity yeah. Yeah. comes to Wonderful. the surface. Yeah. Okay, are there any other questions? Can we get some more? It's wonderful we got a voice. We have, <laughs> yes, yes. Any other hands to raise, either with a question for Jean, with a comment about the impossible that you have done in the past? Uh, let's see. Here is Jefferson Parson. Let's see, I think he's now Hi, on the large you, mic. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Good. Okay. Well, I'm a little confused, first of all, because we shared our our impossible tasks and our impossible uh, visions with our group, and I guess that was not heard because now we're being asked to say them again, or what's the story? No, what you can do is just share a little bit of what came up in the group about the impossible things that you've done. That would be very oh. interesting to hear. Okay, well, I'll just talk about my own and okay. <laughs> let the other people bring forward theirs. Was sure. That um, I, I um, first, I was very inspired by your talk, Jean, and uh, but secondly, um, personally, um, I taught myself to be a stone carver. That's oh, why no. the story of the stone canoe was fascinating yeah. to me and inspiring. Mm-hmm. Um, that seemed pretty impossible at the time, and then in my second incarnation as an artist, I've I've been, uh, I'm becoming a songwriter and a musician, mm-hmm. and so that's exciting as well. As far as what I see is um, my my role, what pains me more than anything else in the world, I think, is the, the maiming and killing of innocent people, and I see this going mm-hmm. on now, particularly with the drones. And uh, I, I, I want to somehow help to stop this, and uh, all I've been able to do so far is to begin a song about it. But then for, for the collective, I'd like to uh, work collectively on that and the peace projects collectively. Um, and another collective goal I see was we need to move from the big idea of making money to the bigger, more important idea of 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 
satisfying, you know, of, of, of helping people realize what they achieve, what they need, you know, in in the world, and and, and overcoming hunger and all of that. And that we need a, a major, major paradigm shift. And and uh, you know, my question to you is like, is how, how are we going to bring this about? Well, you know, I always find that when I study the big transformations, the, even the renaissances in different societies, whether it is our 15th to 17th century European renaissance or the great renaissance in the 8th and 9th century in the Tang dynasty in China <laughs> or 5th century Greece, often these renaissances, these radical renewals come out of a time of violence and chaos where people said enough already. And and they, uh, it's as if there is a renaissance of spirit and a shift in perspective. Now, one of the things that I, as a social artist, try to do is to look at the shifts in perspectives that are occurring, uh, just like uh, occurred in during the, rena- the the European Renaissance, where suddenly, with uh, with uh, Leonardo da Vinci writing his monograph on perspective, suddenly things were not flat. Paintings were no longer flat. You had depth, music went from ah, 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 to polyphony. Uh, they discovered the flowing of the blood. Michelangelo creates the Duomo. You have the telescope. You've got the microscope. You've got intercontinental space. But now the perspective has also changed radically, where we know, we look into the microcosm, we see the macrocosm, we know that we are a little tiny planet on the corner of a galaxy, and it which contains a hundred billion stars, and there are something like a trillion galaxies out there in our own universe, and there may be many universes. Suddenly it's all shifted, and in our own consciousness we have access in some way at incredible depth levels to the totality, to the totality itself. What I do in my work is try to engender a passion for the possible while discovering what that possible is. Now, who knows these things? Is it scientists? No, it isn't, because they they are often caught in a certain kind of kosher t- tunnel vision, and they regard anything beyond it, just like the Catholic Church regarded Galileo, as superstition. But what we do find is it is always the artists who lead the way. You speak of yourself, you know, as, as, as the songwriter and as the stonemason and the stone carver. It is the artist who be, is able to put into their form and their symbolic code those very, very images that quicken and evoke and awaken the, the, the forgotten but long known depths of the human spirit that causes people to be activated, to be ignited to the next possibility in the new mind, new world, new ways of being. Thank you. And I find this because I've worked in 108 countries, I have to say it is almost always the artists who ultimately provide the way through. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jean, thank you so much for these wonderful responses to the questions. I see our time is flying by. Yes. And I wanted. to I wanted to turn our attention for just a few moments to the wonderful guidelines you've offered in the beginning of Manual for the Peacemaker. Mm -hmm. Uh, You really offer um, excellent uh, thoughts for each group that forms to Mm -hmm. do the processes that you've offered in Manual for the Peacemaker and to build their circle, to build a powerful, supportive, trusting mm-hmm. circle with one another. Would you like to touch on a couple of those? Or uh, Well, I, yeah, sure, I could, but let me just say how I came to this. You know, I was sitting by the bed of Margaret Mead in the hospital while she was dying, and she said, listen, forget everything I've been teaching you about working with governments and bureaucracies. She'd been training me for six years. I said, now you tell me this now. She said, yes, I'm being here a uh, anthropologist on my own dying, fascinating experience. There's no hierarchy to it. But I see things, Jean, and I see that if we are going to survive and grow and green our time, it's a question of people getting together and teaching learning communities growing in body, growing in mind, taking great stories and using them as the incentive to expand the story of their life and time. 
So I would have to say this is how it begins. Create in your own world and also on these calls that we're trying to work together. This is a whole new experiment, but it's going to work. A teaching learning community. Now, is it family? Yes. Friends, certainly colleagues, students, uh, if you're ministers, parishioners. And bring fresh new conversation. It's not about gossip and it's not about psychotherapy. Because if you have a psychotherapy uh, uh, circle, I'm going to assure you, you always get the psychic carnivore who takes up all of the time and wastes your, your time. So it's really about creative, emerging uh, communities really growing together while they create new ideas. And also, you know, you're going to have all kinds of differences. And one of the things is that working in these kind of communities helps to eradicate one of the worst tyrannies that afflict, if, afflict the, the human condition, uh, the one of the dominant perception. If it's good enough for me, it's good for you. Why can't you respond like everyone else does? You know you've got some real anger there. None of that stuff. What you do is you, I regard everybody as God in hiding, and I'm always stunned at what they have to say. So, you know, you're not limited to your own experience. You're sharing the enormous richness of experience of the others, you see, and you don't project your stuff onto them. And, of course, you, you know that allies are needed. I mean, the peacemaker circles provide these allies. And also, you know, when you have the allies and the other, they keep you on track. They keep you to doing what you say you're going to do. You check in. And so you've got a kind of uh, way in which you're always being observed into your excellence. That's the only way I can say it. And uh, sacred space is very important because you, you, you always assign members to take responsibility for obtaining and preparing the setting if you're going to meet together. The setting is treated as it is with all indigenous people as truly sacred space. Now, just like the Native Americans begin by burning sage, you know, to have sweetness. Uh, they bring holy smoke that purges the negative thoughts and allows for a new order of being to enter in. And uh, you, you, um, you, you, you also take time, each person or whoever wants to speak, but not the same old, same old, because you do have people who are used to being dominant. And if, if there's a psychotherapist in the group, they have to be remembered that they leave their therapy uh, hats outside where people truly listen to each other. And they make a commitment to take responsibility for their own experience, for their own way of doing, and really being respectful of the other and listening deeply, deeply to the other. And you always have a, a guide, but the guide is, does not mean leader. You change the guide from time to time. The guide is the one who assists, who enables, who serves the need of the journey. Okay. And that's a very ancient role. That's the midwife of souls. That's the evocateur of growth and transformation. And it's a role of the greatest challenge and responsibility. And it can only be done from centering and from the high self. And... Um, you know, you're, you're very kind to each other. And as I say, you, you really look at each other as, as God in hiding, and you become very empathic to each other, empathic, you know. And you, you express gratitude. It's very important to express gratitude. One of the things I always say is what you appreciate appreciates. Where you really honor the other person, they grow, you know. And you also, you, you make commitment to sustainability of your group. You commit, now people will generally commit for a few months and then entropy enters. <laughs> I can't come, I'm sorry, next week because I've got the dentist appointment. The dentist appointment will always arise at the wrong time. You have to know that. But you really make a sacred commitment to be there, show up, be there for each other. So, and I, I think that with the help, Lauren, of, of this um, not only having people create their own peacemaker circles, but joining in what we're trying to do together as we use this, I think, pretty interesting book, uh, uh, Manual for the Peacemaker, and it has tremendous exercises, very powerful. Uh, after all, it, it, what, what is in that book created democracy all over the world, but also in this year-long teleconferencing um, put on through my foundation, the Gene Houston Foundation. 
it, it can really play as you really get part of it, as you get retrained in, in really brave new ways of being, you're going to, you yourself know that you're going to play a vital role in building not only a social artistry, teaching, learning community in your region, but you are going to create the subtlety of shifts that then move and create the ripples of really a world in transition. Thank you so much, Jean. That was a beautiful invitation to everyone to start your own peacemaker circle or to uh, w working with a circle that you already have, add a few pieces to shift and embrace the full peacemaker commitment. Um, we'll be offering you more elements as we go along of really what uh, the ways that you can encourage peacemaking action in your circles. Um, I'd like to take just a brief moment to read a um, question and comment offered by Jim Markowitz that I had missed earlier, but he says, how to convince Americans, particularly, that greed is not good, that pursuit of material wealth should be a secondary consideration while here on Earth. How to get those that have enough, a steady shelter, a steady food supply, ample free time, to focus on the numerous ideas that would transform their human existences from an essentially selfish one to an essentially helpful one, whether with regard to other people, other species, or the general condition of the planet itself. And this is a beautiful statement, Jim, of peacemaking. That is indeed the aim of peacemaking. I'd like to shift gears now as we come toward the end of our call and invite you back into your virtual circles again for a few minutes. Why? To complete the circle as we always wish to complete and as Jean spoke of a few moments ago, to express gratitude and appreciation. What you appreciate, appreciates, as she said, and it's so critical that we recognize that so often in our society there's a scarcity economy of appreciation operating. We have the chance in our circles and then the many ripples out to express the abundanza, the abundance of our appreciation for one another and our gratitude and bring it fully alive in our circles, part of co-creating this culture of peace. And it will ripple out as you take it from your circle into your families, your friends, your workplaces. So let us go now for about four minutes into your circles and the virtual circles and please take a turn to express a self-appreciation or an appreciation for someone else that you've been sitting in circle earlier when you talked about doing the impossible. And the way we ordinarily express an appreciation, we say the person's name, we ask if they can hear it, it's like knocking on the door before entering, and then we say what we appreciate, what we're grateful for from that person or from ourselves, and then don't, don't get tricked into responding, just breathe in that appreciation. Breathe it in, let it expand and be fully alive. So now let's hear the gong, enter your circles, and when we come out, then we'll come back to the main room and um, just express appreciation for Jean and for one another uh, before we close our evening call. Into our groups. Jean, would you like any closing words? Well, I think this is the time and place and the most interesting time in human history. You know, other times thought they were it, they were wrong, this is it. 
where what we do will profoundly make a difference as to whether we really create and are in tune with what is trying to emerge or we we get very boring and we bore God and we just sit back and hope that something nice will happen. Hegel wrote about world historical individuals, people whose particular passion corresponded to the passion and the turnings of the times. And out in front or behind the scenes, they became the entrepreneurs of progress. They became the ones who ah, stayed in alignment and profoundly made the difference. So I believe that what is beginning here can go out, out, out in powerful and beautiful and extraordinary ways and truly, truly, truly can make the difference. So what I say is let's do it. Let's do it. We have to do it. Marvelous. Marvelous, Jean. Thank you. Thank you so very much for being with us this evening. And I invite all of you. You're so very welcome. And may I just invite everyone here one more time to please go to the Jean Houston Foundation website. Please, if you have not yet registered for the Peacemaker Circle program, please do that. Uh, your $75 will help keep this program going. And um, we would love to support you in any way we can to launch your own Peacemaker Circle, your local face-to-face support for you as we move into doing the impossible. We must join together and work together to do this, and we can make a difference. So please do sign up, and please also consider coming to Ashland we are going to have wonderful gatherings there. It's and so by the way, I'll, I'll be teaching also in that program. In case after Marvelous, Jean. After All August right. 4th, yeah. Mm-hmm. After August 4th, great. You well, I come back from Germany on August 4th where I'm teaching, so I'll, I'll, the, the, I'll be also one of the teachers in that program. Mm-hmm. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. And yeah. let us now open the mics for everyone. Let us say our thanks and our goodbye. Everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank